بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير الخلق والأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى كل من استنى بهداه إلى يوم الدين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه أما بعد Indeed, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all that which exists. And may the praise and safety and security of Allah be upon the most noblest of, of creation and prophets and messenger, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and upon his family and all of his companions and all those who traverse upon their path to the last day. As for what follows... Inshallah ta'ala, we return back to our book, Ta'zimul Ilm, Magnification of Knowledge. And this book that we're going through, the book of Sheikh Saleh, the great scholar of, of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Saleh ibn Abdullah ibn Hamad al Usaymi. May Allah forgive him and have mercy upon him and his family. He began the book, Hafidhullah. Or we in the section of the book, Magnification of Knowledge, Ma'qadis Sadis, the sixth point or junction, which he titles this point or subject matter out of the 20 principles or points of magnifying knowledge. Point number six is Riaya tu Fanunihi Fil Akhdi wa Taqdim al Ahammi Fal Muhim. The Shaykh Hafidhullah, he begins the book, or this particular section, the sixth point or junction, titling it, Guarding and Protecting the Sciences, his sciences in which he's taking knowledge upon, and giving precedence to what's more impo most important for that which is important. And what is this title? Is about this title is talking about how you're supposed to learn the sciences of Islam. It's about how you learn the what's the way the student is supposed to seek it and seize and obtain the sciences of Islam, and what's and what he's supposed to put mo as most important from those sciences before the next thing that's important. And he talks about this. This is very important for students of knowledge to hear this and a regular Muslim because they got benefits. For students of knowledge And it's also a benefit for the regular Muslim As we're going to see And he covers that in three ways He covers that in three ways The first thing he talks about Is the importance of Focusing on learning What is connected to your obligatory worship first Which is upon every Muslim Whether you're a student of knowledge or a regular person That's the most important of knowledge that you learn Secondly He talks after that About the student, how he's supposed to learn the sciences of Islam. What science he's supposed to, I mean, what's the method that he approached learning the various sciences of Islam? That was the second point he brings here that we're about to read. And the third point is then once you have mastered the fundamental sciences of Islam, what you're supposed to do next and how do you approach that? Meaning reaching the next level, which is leading to becoming a scholar. Uh, these points are very beneficial, not just for the, what we're about to cover, not just for the fact of what we just said, but also for the life of the Muslim, the importance of organizing, the importance of putting things in categories, in categories and giving things in your life what's most important before what's important, as we're about to say. And we're going to read the text of the book, and then we're going to explain those three points. He says, Hafidhullah, we quote the Arabic. Inna surat al-mustahsanatu Inna surat al-mustahsana Yazidu husnuha Bittamattu al-basri Bi jami' al-ajzaihi Wa yafutu min husniha Inda al-nadiri Bi qadri ma yahtajibu anhu Min ajzaiha Al-ilmu haakatha He says in the beginning of the book And again recording the Arabic Because there's people who listening Who knows Arabic And want to be able to know How to read the text whether they are present now or they may um, listen to this later. 
because they have may have this book as some of the students in the class have this book. He says, indeed, he's given a, an example here. He says, indeed, a beautiful picture increases in its beauty. Is when the person who's looking at that beautiful picture is able to see every parts and aspects of that picture. It will increase the beauty of the picture when he's able to see every aspect of that picture. Nothing in that picture is being hidden from him. And this is why you find when we look at art and a person goes to look at a picture, the art becomes more expensive the more beautiful and the more clear the picture becomes for the looker and being able to see all of the beauties that's in that particular picture. He says this concept, he says that when the beauty of parts of that picture, he misses the looker at the time he's looking at it. That beauty of it is going to be based upon the degree of what is blocked from his sight from the all from the various parts of that particular picture. He says knowledge is like that. Knowledge is the same way. It's meaning it comprises of many parts that draws a whole picture or draw it makes a person to see the full understanding of the religion. By knowing the various parts and understanding the various parts from the various sciences of Islam will enable him to totally comprehend that whole religion. And he feels and lives and understands the true beauty of Islam because Islam is a way of life. He says, just like this is the case for a picture, that's the case in the sciences in knowledge of this deen. That whoever... In, Guards and learns and understands all of the sciences and part, parts of knowledge by seizing it by him learning and achieving something from every science of Islam, a small portion of it. Then what will occur to that student, he will, he will become perfect in being able to and having the ability to grasp all of the sciences of Islam and all of the aspects of the deen by learning something of every one of the sciences of Islam, the basics of every one of the sciences of Islam. He says, so here he's clarifying, just like that beautiful picture and being able to appreciate the beauty that lies in a beautiful picture is being able to view all parts of that picture, not just one aspect of the picture. Likewise, is the deen of Islam. If you, when you only understand one aspect of the deen and you don't understand the full picture of Islam, you're limited in being able to see the true beauty of the deen and the true benefits of the deen of Islam. But when you understand all of its parts and all of its sciences, that enables you to get the greatest benefit in the religion of Islam. And so he says, when, and that is done by the student of knowledge, learning some portion of every science of Islam. When he learns every portion, a portion from every science of Islam, he's able to see the full picture of this deen away. Allah and his messenger intended it to be seen and understood. And when you lack in having that and only have an aspect or portions of the deen of Islam, that limits your ability to compass, encompass the whole beauty and the whole bounty of this deen. And so the Shaykh Hafidhullah, he quotes after that, he says, Qala Ibn al-Jawzi, that Ibn Jawzi says in his famous book, which is translated to English, called Sayyidul Khatir, Khatiri, Sayyidul Khatirahu, Sayyidul Khatirahu, um, they translate the book to, call, to be called Captured Thoughts. It's a real thick book, somebody translated it. And if you should have this book, because it, it's him talking about everything in this book. He quotes something he says in the book. And this, he says, is Jam'ul Uloom Mamdouh. It's under the title Gathering the Science, Collecting the Sciences of Islam is Praiseworthy. Collecting the Sciences of Islam is Praiseworthy. And he quotes the poem. He says, Min kulli fannin khud wa la tajhal bi fal hurru muttali'un ala al asrari. He says, from every science and skill set in the religion, seize it. 
and do not be ignorant of it. For the person who that verily true freedom is being able to read and look upon all of the secrets, all of the secrets, meaning. You true when you grasp all of the sciences of Islam, you're able to truly see the secrets and wisdoms behind everything in your deen. And he says he's making this statement here because we all should be able to relate, as we said before, and Nasu people become be. They become enemies to the thing that they're ignorant of. People become enemies to the thing that they are ignorant of. And once, when you're ignorant of something, reason why you become enemies to it, because you oppose it. And you don't know you're opposing it. It's like you're an enemy to that thing. And then when you've been told or you see that thing that you're ignorant of, you disdain it. And think it's something bad or something wrong. But the reality of it is, is beautiful. And this is what happens, this is one of the reasons why, and I'm going to add this as an example, that you find many Muslim marriages don't be successful. Because it's not based off of understanding knowledge of the rights of one another and being able to work together in knowing your places and giving everything a right that is due is right. That lacking having that knowledge when someone who's trying to execute and give you your right or do what Allah commands them to do, the other person may reject it because they don't understand this is what Allah wants. So he became or she became the enemy to that particular thing. And this is a praiseworthy thing with Allah and his messenger. And that's because of ignorance. And so the sheikh here, I'm, I'm reaching with this far, far, this far reaching example, but I'm trying to get y'all to get y'all to understand that when you see the full picture of something, you're better able to comprehend it and appreciate it and then implement that thing in the best manner. This is why we understand in Islam and in any educational field, when you first start something in the beginning, it'd be difficult to understand. Then when you be first start learning that particular thing, you grasp some of it. But when later on, when you go further and higher levels of knowledge, you better understood that basic thing that you had learned early on. You get a better grasp of it later on now because you got more knowledge for things that's linked, that's connected to it. Because the deen of Islam is one deen, but it needs to be broken down into these parts so that you can comprehend all of it. So this is what the point is he's saying. He's, then he says after that, يَقُولُ شَيْخُ شُيُّخِنَا مُحَمَّدُ بْنُ مَانِعٍ رَحِمُهُ اللَّهِ فِي إِرْشَادِ الطُّلَابِ He says, Sheikh Usaymi, he says that a, the scholar of our sheikhs, meaning the sheikh of the sheikhs that he learned from, a scholar who was the teacher to the scholars who he had learned from, meaning Sheikh Saleh Usaymi, the author of this book. He says the sheikh of our sheikhs, our scholars, his name was Muhammad ibn Umanir. Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy upon him. He mentions in his book called Irshad al-Tulab, Guiding the Students. It was a book he wrote and entitled it, the meaning of the translation of the title, Guiding and Giving Proper Directives to the Students. This book was totally written like this book to learn, teach us how to be students. Because like we said before, when Allah Ta'ala says, Today I've completed for you your religion. It completed in every aspect, even in these aspects, how to learn the religion. That's worth because it's worship. If learning your religion is going to help your worship and you can't learn the religion, you can't practice religion except that you got to learn, then the dean going to teach you the things that's going to best help you learn this religion. So this is worship in and of itself. That's why Ibn Sadin said, Al-ilm, and he learned this from the companions, Al-ilmu, al-deenu ilmu. That al ilmu deen, or that this religion is the deen, it is, I mean, that knowledge is deen itself. So look carefully to the one whom you take your knowledge from. Look carefully to the one whom you take knowledge from. So that's deen itself. So these points that he's saying here, the sheikh of his scholars he learned from, he said his name was Muhammad ibn Umanir. They all him. And the scholars before him and the scholars of today have written books covering, explaining the deen on how to learn this deen so we could be successful. Because if you don't do it the way the Salaf did it, 
the predecessors had done it. It's not to say you can't learn knowledge. You're not going to learn somebody. It's going to always, the less, the more you turn, or you learn knowledge different from the way the seller established knowledge to be learned, the less, the less benefit you're going to get from the way you learn knowledge that's outside of that way. The more you imitate them, the greater the benefit will be for you in your life. So, he mentions here his sheikh from the scholar, from the, who was the sheikh of his scholars he learned from. His name was Muhammad ibn Umayyad. This man was born in the year 1300, which is around 1878 to 1882. And he died in 1965, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Umayyad al-Mani'r. He was from Uneza. He was a scholar from Uneza, which is in Saudi Arabia, which is the same area where Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was from. And so he, he learned, this Sheikh had learned the sciences of Islam, where he was from in Saudi Arabia, and then he traveled all over the Muslim world learning his deen. Many years studying, and he didn't stop till the year 1329. When he turned 29, he stopped studying and traveling all over the place. And he died in 1965 from prostate cancer. He went to, at that time, in the 1960s, he went to Beirut to go get medical treatment, and he died while he went there. And they buried him in Doha in Qatar. And the ulama there prayed over him, as did the scholars when he was in Beirut, prayed over him where he died at. And he was a great scholar of Islam. He says in his book, Irshad al Tulab, It is not permissible for, uh, for the virtuous one, meaning, the one who goes seek knowledge to raise ignorance from himself. He's called al-fadil, a virtuous person. He said, it is not permissible for the virtuous person to abandon a science from the beneficial sciences of Islam. In which helps him to understand the book and the sunnah. إذا كان يعلم من نفسه قوة if he knows or when he knows and realizes about his own self he has the capability and strength على تعلمه to learn the sciences ولا يسوغ له أن يعيب العلم الذي يجهله ويزري بعالمه he said then it becomes impermissible for him to find fault with a science in which he's ignorant of and then to belittle and disdain the scholar of that science. You understand that? Is that clear? I'll repeat that statement again. And that's the end quote, I think. Is that the end quote? Oh, no, he continues further. Again, he says, It is not permissible for the virtuous one, meaning one who's seeking knowledge, that he abandons a science from the beneficial sciences of Islam, in which aids him upon understanding the Book, meaning the Quran, understanding the book and the Sunnah, the traditions of the Prophet. He, since or when he realizes within himself he has the capability and strength to learn them, to learn it. And it's not permissible for him to find fault with a science in which he's ignorant of and then turn around and disdain and belittle the scholar of that science because he's ignorant of it, in other words. And then he goes on and says, for indeed this, meaning belittling another science that you're ignorant of, of Islam, or belittling the scholar of that science, is nothing more than signs of deficiency in that person and decadence and low base qualities. فلعاقل, the one who's wise and intelligent, it is a must that he speaks when he speaks, he speaks with knowledge, based on knowledge. And when he's quiet, he keeps quiet out of being forbearing and returning ignorance with intelligence. He'd be quiet based on forbearance. Because otherwise, he will enter and fall into the statement of the famous poet, the famous poem. Atani, pay attention to this poem, it's kind of cute, may Allah bless me to translate it. He says, Atani anna sahlan dhamma jahla uluma laysa ya'rifu hunna sahlu uluma law qara'aha ma qalaha walakinna rida bil jahli sahlu. 
<laughs> this is a beautiful poem. May Allah bless me to be able to translate it for everyone. He says in this poem, Muhammad ibn Umani, in bringing the point that the intelligent person must, when he speak, he must speak with knowledge. And, and when he keep quiet, when they say keep quiet, having a settled state, not just being quiet in his mouth, but knowing when to be quiet. He must do that in the, having being forbearing, showing forbearance. He says, and what, what does that mean? Why he says that, being forbearing? Because when you're ignorant of something and a person who has knowledge of the thing that you're ignorant of and you hear them speak, it may seem to you as something wrong. And being that you don't know, you should, out of forbearance, keep your mouth shut. Because you're only going to speak with knowledge. That's why the Salaf used to say, Man Whoever speaks in something they're not skilled in, they will say crazy, astonishing things. They will say crazy, astonishing things. This is a principle in the deen of Islam. That's why we speak with knowledge. That's why Allah says, La taqfu ma laysa laka bihi ilm. Do not find yourself speaking about that which you don't have knowledge of. Inna al basara wal fu'ada. Inna al basara wal fu'ada. For indeed, was sama, indeed the hearing, the sight, and the heart will be kana mas'ulan, will be questioned. لا تقف ما ليس لك به علم إن ف إن البصر والفؤاد إن السمع والبصر والفؤاد كان عنه مسؤولة. Do not find yourself speaking about that which you have no knowledge of. Allah says in the Quran. Do not find yourself speaking about that which you have no knowledge of. For indeed, the hearing, the sight, and the heart will be questioned on the day of judgment. So because of this, you find the salaf. Starting with the companion, the messenger of Allah, then the companions and all those who follow them, they become known for their character, known when to speak and when not to speak. And when they speak, they speak with knowledge. And when they're quiet because they don't know and they humble themselves because they may be understanding something opposite of what the one who's speaking with knowledge may be saying. So he keeps his mouth shut. Like I remember one time, I'm trying to bring this where we clarify these points for our brothers. Because we're not used to learning like this and learning how to learn. So this is important to talk about this because this is talking about the manners of learning this deen. So this got to be done with delicacy, delicacy and patience and intelligence. Because when I learned this stuff, it blew my mind. I was like, subhanAllah, I'm a jahil. I was ignorant. I didn't know how to seek. I thought I knew how to seek knowledge because the Western method of learning, we think is the right method. Because that's the only way we know. But it's not. And the signs that is not. Most people who get a college degree, they, it makes them be arrogant with that degree and they more, they better than other. I'm, I got more, they, they think about themselves, I'm, I'm a um, more ref, re refined person, you know, and I'm not going to bring myself to, to those non-educated people's standards. No, real knowledge humbles you and make you see yourself beneath the people because it's your job to braise them upon what you, Allah, raised you on. So you carry the harm that they give you. And don't return it except with that which will produce better and humble them to take knowledge from. Like took case, what was the case when the man came to Ibn Abbas and just started reviling him and calling him all types of names. And he stood there quietly and not responding. Not let, it wasn't even bothering him, the stuff he was saying about him. And when he finished, he ordered Ikram, his student, to give this man whatever he need because it's obviously something is bothering him. He didn't even think about what he said about him. Because he understands the one who knows ain't like the one who don't know. But he has to behave humbly and more patiently than the one who don't know. So that one day he will come out of that state of ignorance. And when the man saw that behavior from Ibn Abbas, he quickly doused his anger and humbled himself to Ibn Abbas. And this is how the messenger was able to bring the deen to the, to the Quraysh people. When they persecuted him and tortured him and called him all types of negative names, he returned their ignorance with forbearance, and eventually they all accepted Islam. So understand this reality. So here, back to the point, is that this poem we're about to translate is clarifying how the intelligent person is a must that he speaks with knowledge or he keeps quiet out of forbearance. Otherwise, he will enter under the statement of this poet. 
The poet says, has come to me, or has, yeah, has come to me that easiness blames ignorance. Ease blames ignorance. Has come to me, or has reached me, that easiness finds blameworthy ignorance to the sciences of Islam. Have finds blame that easiness finds blameworthy ignorance in the sciences. Laysa yarifu hunna sahlu. And ease, he has no awareness of the sciences. He has no awareness of the sciences. Had he read the sciences, he wouldn't hate them at all. But because being content with ignorance, being content with ignorance is easy. Do y'all get what he's saying here? Poetry in Arabic, is, it, 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 it makes you think. Poetry, period. Good poems are poems that make you think about stuff that you don't usually think about. What he's trying to say here in this poem, he given a similar to of a person who's ignorant from a person who knows. And the reason why the person is ignorant, because it's easy to find blameworthy that which you're ignorant of. So you don't have to learn it. He says, so you become like this person when you speak without knowledge. And you don't keep your mouth shut because you ain't got no forbearance with you. That you're going to find blameworthy that which you're ignorant of. When if you kept your mouth shut and listened to that which you're ignorant of, you may learn something and improve yourself and better yourself. Arrogance is the only thing make you reject that. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam defined agnor agnor uh, arrogance. He defined it as what? Ramplunas. Um... Rejecting the truth and disdaining the people. Meaning, you reject the truth when it reaches you and you look down upon people. That's arrogance in Islam. That's arrogance. And so, this is the essence of what's happening here. Ease found ignorance blameworthy. Ease found, came to me that ease found ignorance blameworthy. In relation to the sciences, meaning being ignorant of the sciences, being blameworthy. But he does not realize that the sciences, Sahla never learned and understood them, these sciences. If only he had read them, he would not hate them. But being content with being ignorant is easy. <laughs> and that's the reality. And I'm going to give an illustration of that in our time. You have a group of, unfortunately, students of knowledge. We have a group of students of knowledge, or so-called students of knowledge, I should say, who went and spent five minutes learning his dean, and they barely know the basics of the dean. And, but when they come back home, because he knows a little bit more Arabic than the average person, average believer, he's raised up in the community. And looked at to have something he really doesn't have. He didn't study long enough to raise ignorance from his own self. So he comes back. And instead of knowing the, the sciences of Islam and the etiquettes of giving da'wah and mannerisms, he go and teach the people and cause more harm than he bring benefits. One of the things he does, he become busy with refuting his brothers and sisters who share with him in teaching the deen for whatever jealous reason. And he begins to refute them. It's because he don't understand what they know. He may have not achieved their level of knowledge or education. So when he hears them speak, he finds them blameworthy. Instead of being patient, it's easy for him to find blameworthy what he's ignorant of of those people. So what you'll find many of our brothers do, because this man may be more educated than me. This man may be able to benefit the people more than me. He turns around and talk about this brother to chase the people away from him. Or talk about another masjid so the people stay away from it. And then you ask that person, what's wrong with these people you're warning against and talking about? 
he's unable to give you anything definitive. He'll say, I heard. I heard that they or him or that master, I heard. He don't know from his own experience. He based it off of what he heard. Why? Because it's easier to stay ignorant of him and talk about it than to go and engage and know for certain. Just like this poem is saying. So don't become this person who speak with no knowledge and don't know how to be quiet out of forbearance. And this become a day done with many of our brothers. Had that brother went to this masjid, had that brother went to this um, group of people and tried to invite them to what's right or ascertain is true what I heard. Because nine times out of ten, what he heard is usually a lie or a minuscule of what he heard may have some truth, the truthfulness to it. Had he done that, he would have found something different. And the reason why we don't do that is easy to just look at somebody and find them blameworthy. It's easier than to go and spend time with them and have to sit with them and educate them and have to research and find where the mistakes is at. And to go through all of that. No, nah, it's just easy for me to call, give them look what based on what I heard or what I think I see to give them a name and call them this or that. Just like the poem is saying here. That's because they didn't learn the etiquette of knowledge. And they didn't learn the etiquette of the character of the believer. And so they behave like this from their own ignorance that they was raised upon or environment that they grew in and call it and do it now in the name of the dean. And this is dangerous because today these ignorant people do these things in the name of Islam. And so that the people will accept it from them. Did you hear what the noble brother said about so and so and such and such? And if you question them, yeah, akhi. where you get this from? He first, he may look at you like you're crazy. Like, what? You questioning what I'm saying? Or he may have gotten so bad in doing, having his evil characteristics. When you question him, he never was expecting that. He may not even know how to respond. So if he have goodness in his heart, he may check himself, say, I stuck for Allah, may Allah forgive me. Let me go find out what's true. But this isn't the case with many of us. Many of us will in turn and say, oh, I'm going to warn against you because you're questioning what I'm telling you. Because everything come out of my mouth is the haq. Like the messenger of Allah. <laughs> so brothers and sisters, this evil is an evil characteristic. Then the sheikh moves on. He says that's the end of the speech of, in, this, in this section of the book that Muhammad ibn Umani' the sheikh has written. He says, the sheikh, the author of this book, he says, He said that a person that benefiting from learning the sciences and safeguarding them in your heart and in your life, the sciences of knowledge is going to be, you won't be able to benefit from doing, learning them, except you must do it based upon two foundations. You must depend on two foundations. Number one, the first of those two foundations is taqdeem al-ahammi fal muhim, is by giving precedence and importance to what's most important for you to learn first, and then that which is important. And that thing that's going to be most important is the thing that the student is in need of, in dire need of the most. And for him in establishing and implementing in his life. In the responsibility of establishing the jobs of worship of Allah. So he first must learn what is upon him to learn. For his own worship to his Lord. That's the first thing. That's the first thing he focuses on. He don't get into the science of hadith. The science of this. The science of that. First he must learn what he need to pray. What he need to believe in Allah. What he need to have noble character. And what he need in the etiquette of his worship. That's the first thing that every Muslim has to know. He says so his first he cannot obtain the science of Islam to first, number one, first, he give precedence to what's most important than that which is important. And those things that's most important is the things that the students in need is in dire need of having in the establishment of the jobs of the worship, worshiping Allah, of his worship for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he quotes a statement of one of the Salaf in this regard. He says, Su'ila Mali Kubani Anas, that Imam Malik ibn Anas, the great Imam of Daru Hijra of Medina, from the four methods, Imam Malik, he said he was questioned. And he was called the Imam al-Darul Hijra. He was called the Imam of the place of Hijra, meaning Medina. 
He was the great scholar during his time. He was the most knowledge imam of the scholars in, in Medina. He was asked عن طلب العلم about seeking knowledge. فقال, and he said, حَسَنٌ جَمِيلٌ It is beautiful and good seeking knowledge. وَلَكِنْ انْظُرِ الَّذِي يَلْزِمُكَ مِنْ حِينِ تُصْبِحُ إِلَى حِينِ تُمْسِي فَالْزَمْهُ Imam Malik then said, again, repeat the first part. What is, what he was asked about seeking knowledge. He said, it is beautiful and it is good, but look to that which is obligatory upon you that you must, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. From the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. Adhere to that first. You get that? Repeat that again. So, because I probably not the best translator. He says, It is beautiful and good, but look to that which is obligatory upon you from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. Adhere to it first. قال أبو عبيدة معمر بن المثنى رحمه الله he said Abu Ubaidah Ma'mur ibn Muthna great person of knowledge of the past may Allah have mercy upon him he said من شغل نفسه بغير المهم أضر بالمهم he said whoever busies himself with other than what's most important upon him then he's going to harm the thing that is important for him, him to know. Whoever busies himself with other than what's most important, he's going to cause harm to that thing that's important for him to know. We're going to give examples for that after we finish reading the translation of this. No, I'll give you the example now, inshallah ta'ala. He's, the example of this that the sheikh himself, the author, mentioned his explanation of his own book. He says the first thing that is obligatory upon us to first learn the things that is obligatory upon us to do in regards to the worship of Allah. That comes first from the things of knowledge that you learn. And he gave an example. He says the example is a person is he had the option to learn Arabic language or learn the fiqh of his worship, like wudu, salah. He said, which one is more obligatory upon him to learn the Arabic language or the fiqh of wudu and salat. Of course, the second one. So, if he be fall negligent in learning what's most obligatory and he's embarking upon learning Arabic, he's going to cause harm to what's most important for him. Now he's going to innovate in his wudu and his prayer not be accepted. He's going to do it wrong. He's going to pray opposing the way the messenger of Allah legislated the prayer. He ain't going to know the conditions, the pillars, the obligations, the sunnah of the prayer. And he violate them and make his prayer null and void. So this is what is meant by this statement of Abu Ubaidah. Whoever busy himself with other than what's most important, he will cause harm to what's important. You get it? And we do this all too much, brothers. You will see a person, he wants to get up and pray tarawih or late, I mean, qiyam the night prayer. But then he sleep past fajr. He's negligent to what's most important because doing something that's important but it's not the most important like this and then he quotes a, a poem in that regards that he wrote he says give put first what's most important for indeed knowledge is conglomerating many things of the deen he says that one's lifespan is nothing but like a vision, a visiting phantom or visiting vision. Or it's like a guest who's visiting. Your lifespan, because it goes by so fast. Don't waste your lifetime and leave and not focus on what's most important and you barking upon that which is least important. Because that lifespan is going to go by so fast. You're going to look back. And it's like a phantom, a phantom or a vision that just visited or a guest who came to visit. You get it? And so this dean is beautiful, mashallah. That's what the poem says. So that's the first thing. The first thing that's going that you must depend upon 
from the two foundations to be able to preserve the sciences of Islam is number one, by focusing, giving presence to what's most important than that which is important. He said the second thing, al akhir, the last thing of the two, and yakuna qastahu fi awwali talabihi tahsilu muhtasiran fi kulli fannin. Now he's going to get into how to seek knowledge. He says, is that let be the intent in regards to the first thing that he seeks is obtaining knowledge of learning in a bridge book in regards to each and every science of, of Islam, which we kind of touched on when we had the other class. That you got to learn a book, and we call them metan in Islam. It's a metan, a book that takes the, to sci the particular science of Islam and it conglomerates it in small words, the most important fundamental things of that science that needed that not one must know in order to understand bigger things in that science you get it like you can't learn for example i think we could relate this you can't learn geometry algebra if you don't know arithmetic if you don't learn fractions you can't learn that correct you can't learn that first you got to learn these things so that you can learn the greater things. That's your foundation. So every science of Islam, a scholar wrote a small abridgment of that science and the most fundamental things that you need to know so you can understand the bigger things in that science. Because if you embark upon that which is bigger, you will misunderstand it because you ain't got its most basics. You get it? So he said, first the student must make the intent in the beginning of his seeking of knowledge to obtain a abridged book in every science of Islam. Until he completes the categories of the beneficial sciences of Islam. And then once he have learned a fundamental abridgment of the basics of each science of Islam, then he can look at his nature and find what he's capable of or what he's going to, what's natural and easy for him to focus on from the sciences of Islam. Now he can go and say, I'm going to focus on hadith science. Now he can say, I'm going to focus on tef's explanation of the Quran. Now he can say, I'm going to be a specialist in the sciences of the Quran. Now he can say, I'm going to specialize in fiqh and its principles and its fundamental rules. He can do these things once he learned the basics of each science. Because he got a general proper understanding of the whole religion. Because if he don't do that, he's going to misappropriate that greater information. That's why the Salaf has said, the Rabbani, the true cultivator based on Allah's legislation, is the one who teaches lesser knowledge before greater knowledge. Now you understand what that means, because I know you heard that statement before. That's a Rabbani. Allah ordered us to be Rabbani, meaning the one who bases his dawah, his learning, his teaching on the Lord's legislation. His first attribute is he teach lesser knowledge before greater knowledge. Because if you teach greater knowledge to people that know, don't know the basics, you want to mess up. I go, I'll give you an example. If I go and take Sheikh al Bani's book and teach you that book and you didn't learn the fundamentals of, of prayer, because Sheikh al Bani books about the Salah, which is a very advanced book. And I go teach you that and you didn't learn the basics, you're going to misappropriate the basic stuff and violate them. Maybe lead your prayer to be an invalidated. So this is important to understand. And then the Sheikh, he says after that, he goes and learn these signs. And then he can branch off and see where his nature fit and what he likes of a science that he wants to focus on to become a, spe a specialist in a particular area. There's no problem becoming a specialist, but when you embark upon mastering a science and you don't know the fundamentals, this is blameworthy. And the sheikh gave an example of that. He said a person go and learn usulu fiqh, the fundamental rules for, that you be able to extract the principles from the hadith of the prophet. He go learn that science. But then you ask him, Akhi, how do you make wudu? Or how to, what, if, what I do in this case in the prayer? He can't answer that question because he don't know it. Then he'll say to you, well, you know, I specialized in this. A'udhu billah. You have to learn the fundamentals first. He said, he gave an example. The sheikh said, you got a person when it comes to adhkar, remembrance in the morning and evening. 
You say to the brother, he want to learn another science from you. You say, Achi, you need to learn the adhkar. He said, Achi, learn the adhkar, the remembrances of Allah. He said, man, that's easy. I don't need to study that. I don't need a teacher to teach me that. He said, you don't? He said, then you turn around and ask him a question. And he gave an example. He says, you say to him, if I'm traveling and I combine my salat, Maghrib and Isha, do I make my dhikr after Maghrib for just the Maghrib dhikr? And then I wait to Isha, since I prayed it already with Maghrib, I make the Isha dhikr? Or do I combine the dhikrs and make them one dhikr? Or do I wait and do them in Isha time? What am I supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? He asked the student. The student go, I don't know. He said, but he said he don't, it's easy. He don't need to learn about adhkar. But that's something that he pulling out of his pocket saying is easy. No, you because you ask him, what teacher you sat with and taught you this? Or teaching the adab of the etiquette of how to seek knowledge and the character of the believer. He don't know this. And now he embarks with dealing with the people and he gives them the most funkiest of characters. The worst of behavior. In the name of the deen. And say he's okay for me treating him like this. Because he didn't learn that. So you understand why this learning must be in these types of stages. And then the sheikh he says. And then now he knows the student what he's capable of. Because now he got the fundamental science. So he got a good grasp of every science of Islam. So he can embark upon learning. I remember when we studied. The sheikh used to teach us the fundamental sciences of Islam in this fashion. And he would say to us, I'm teaching you this way so that now you are able to go into the greater books and learn on your own. Because you got the fundamentals to be able to do so. This is why I, be, it, I find it disturbing when I see a student of knowledge, like just recently a well-known student of knowledge, get on the minbar and tell people that they can take from anybody... You just have to know what to take that's good and leave that which is bad. When you don't have the fundamentals of the deen to be able to know what's good from what's bad. Or very little of that. And then he brought the hadith of when Abu Huraira was collecting the zakat al-fitr. And shaitan came in the form of a human being and was stealing the zakat al-fitr. And he caught him. And took it back from him. And he was going and he let him go. He came back the second day, did it again. He was pardoning him and let him go. When he did it the third day, he grabbed me and said, I'm taking you to the messenger of Allah. And he told him, no, no, don't. Then he told him, if I teach you something that can benefit you, will you not take me to the messenger of Allah? And, you know, the companions was avarice for knowledge, for avarice to learn what's going to draw them closer to Allah under any circumstance. He said, yes. And he told him, if you recite Ayatul Kursi, at night it will protect you from the shaitan till the morning. And he left, and the Prophet said, who was your visitor late? Your, your, who was your tariq? Who was your night visitor? And he told him, he said, indeed, and then he brought him, told him what he said. He said, indeed, he told you the truth, but he's a great liar because he was shaitan. But look, he used this hadith as a proof to say you can do that. Pick what's good and leave it. That ain't what that hadith is teaching. That's teaching us that you bring what you hear to those who know. So they can ascertain what's right from what's wrong. And that's what the messenger of Allah, right? Abu Huraira didn't just run what that man said to him. He went to the one who's the most knowledgeable amongst them and brought the situation to him. And the prophet said he told you the truth in spite of the fact that he's a great liar. We don't do that. Just try to cipher for ourselves. This is bottom thing that this particular brother had said. So back to the point the author then goes on. He says, For yet the Bahar, now that student can become expansive now, like an ocean, become an ocean of knowledge, because he has the fundamental sciences of every science of Islam. Now he can embark to study the deen. Because each science is connected to the other. So he has that ability now to go and delve into greater things to learn from. He says, Sawa'un kana fannan wahidan aw akta. Whether he's going to do that by studying one science at a time or conglomerate two, two or three science at once. And the Shaykh, when he said this, he's clarifying that most people has to do one science at a time. Only a few people have that ability to conglomerate science. As an example, you remember Nawawi. He used to learn several sciences at one time and he had the intelligence and memory to be able to do so. But most people now have that ability. They got to do one science at a time. And this is 
what he's saying. Either it's one science at a time or he can conglomerate. But that's a person that has high level of intelligence and sharpness and keenness of the mind and have amazing memory. Those people can do that. But most people do one science at a time because he can't. He may overwhelm himself with doing many things at one time, many sciences at one time. <sighs> And then the Sheikh he says, "Tumma yanzur al mutaalimu fi ma yumakino hu min tahsiriha, ifrad al fununi wa muhtasiratiha, wahid baad wahid, aw jamg al naha, wal ifrad hu al munasib lil umum al talabi." He basically saying, and then the student who seeking knowledge looks to what his capability is of obtaining knowledge, whether he's able to do individually the sciences from the abridged. Books that's been written that conglomerates the most fundamental principles of each science Doing one after the other or gathering it He said but individualizing them is something that is more suitable Because the general students of knowledge this is what they're only able to do He says Min qawlu ahadihim. He said from the scattered poems that's well known has scattered amongst the people from the Shanaqitas. Shanaqitas is the people from Mauritania. They are known to this very day and historically their method of learning, you got to memorize everything from the sciences of Islam. He says that in to, the poem says in that if you want to obtain a science then perfect that one science. وعن سواه from any other science قبل الانتهاء مهن until or before happens to you the ability not to be able to stop being being able to do that is removed from you وفي تراضي في العلوم من عجاء he said because conglomerating the sciences will hinder you from being able to gain knowledge because you heard the famous statement of the salaf where they say whoever tries to gather knowledge all at one time it will leave him all at one time. You get it? He says, In amani istabaqa He said, when two twin scientists that look similar to one another is in competition to one another, neither one will never come out from the person. He will never be able to get it. And that's most people. Focus on one, master that, move on to the next, like that. And that's the methodology of learning. من عرف من نفسه قدرة whoever knows within himself the ability على جمع جمع the ability to conglomerate many signs then let him do that وكانت حاله استثناء من العموم but this state and being able to do that is something that's an exception to the general rule of most people ومن نواقد هذا المعقد المشاهدة he says from the things that nullifies this point that we're covering right now that has been witnessed and bore witness to is trying the hatefulness the dislike of trying to conglomerate sciences all at once is that it will lead the person to start busying himself with things that don't benefit them why what he means by that because what happens you begin because you don't know how to learn those other sciences you may begin to start studying books that's unknown and not well known with the people of knowledge and taught and that he may come in love with that thing and it's something that he shouldn't learn and may take him the round down the wrong path in that science and he could fall into innovation he says Imam Malik he, he used to say he said evil is strange, a strange science Meaning when you find something that's not well known and obscure And you try to learn from it The reason why it's unknown and obscure Because it's not the best book to learn the fundamentals from You may get something that's advanced And you never comprehend it That's why you need a teacher to direct you He says so evil is strange science Is strange knowledge he said, but the goodness of knowledge is that knowledge that is well known. His book is fundamental, is well known to the people. Many scholars are teaching it. That which many of the people have narrated and taught this book. You get it? Don't go learn something strange that's unknown. It's maybe that person may try to lead you astray with doing that. Or you may lead yourself astray with trying to do that. Not knowing that this is something that I should not be embarking upon and learning. You get that?
And that is the end of that ma'qid. This point. So the three things that we close with that the Sheikh focus on is number one, focusing on learning what you need to know for your worship of Allah, to establish your worship of Allah. All the responsibilities that you need to know in relation to your worship of Allah. And Imam Malik defined it as first focus on learning what you must do from the time you wake up till you go to bed. And if you sit back and assess what that is, it become clear what you need to learn. What you got to do every day. I'm married, so I need to know about the Akam of marriage. I got a business. I need to know about the Akam of business and transactions. I deal with people and raise, I got children to raise. I need to know that I can relate to raising my children. I got to deal with myself all the time. I need to understand what Allah teaches us about my creed and belief so that I can deal with myself and not fall into depression and difficulties and, like this. And secondly, he went on to explain how to seek knowledge by focusing on an abridged book on all the sciences of Islam, Arabic, Fit, so on and so forth. That conglomerates and summarizes the most fundamental things of each science of Islam. That's how you learn knowledge. Then he went on to say, once you do that, you can branch off to whatever you want and specialize if you like. And that was the focus of what he's done. And like I said, this benefits the general Muslim because this teaches us the importance of organizing your life and focusing on what's most important than that which is important. So it benefits even in that. So if the student of knowledge does this in the seeking of his knowledge, he's going to be, he should be of the best of people and organizing and structuring his life for what's most important and then that which is in least important. Is that clear? With that, we come to a conclusion of our presentation. وما كان خطأ وزلل فمني والشيطان وما كان سواب فمن الله فإن الله ورسوله براء من خط بريان من خطئ وزللي. Um, whatever I said was wrong and mistaken was from me and the shaytan. Whatever I said is correct was was from Allah. For indeed Allah and His messenger is free from my errors and mistakes. So inshallah ta'ala, uh, brothers, uh, we would take question and answers, but we got five minutes before we pray. Shah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.